So we're going to talk about the first isomorphism theorem. Now we're going to start by looking at some properties of the kernel of a homomorphism. So if you're already familiar with the basic properties of the kernel, you can skip to the timestamp in the description. So if we have a homomorphism that goes from a group G to a group H, the kernel of that homomorphism is the set of elements such that phi of k is the identity. So it's the set of elements that are mapped to the identity by this homomorphism. Let's take a look at some properties of this kernel. First of all, what is phi of the identity element in G? Well, we know that the identity element in G is equal to eg times eg. And because phi is a homomorphism, we can split this up so it becomes phi of the identity times phi of the identity. Now, if this element, this is some element in H, is equal to phi of eg times phi of eg, we can cancel on both sides, or you could say we multiply by the inverse of this element. Either way, we're going to get that eh is equal to phi of eg, because these two are going to cancel out when we multiply by the inverse, which means that a homomorphism is always going to map the identity in g to the identity in h, and therefore eg is in the kernel of a homomorphism. Now let's suppose that some element k is in the kernel of phi. What is phi of k times k inverse? Well, on one hand, this is pretty obvious because k times k inverse, the inside here is just the identity in g. And we know that that's in the kernel, so this is going to be the identity in h. But on the other hand, we can split up this homomorphism so we get phi of k times phi of k inverse. Now we said before that k is in the kernel of phi. That's our assumption. So this is the identity element in h. Now we know that these two things have to be equal. So what we get is this expression down here, e sub h times phi of k inverse, that has to equal the expression up here, which is e sub h. And of course, this identity element does nothing by definition, which means that phi of k inverse is also the identity in h. And by definition, that means that k inverse is in the kernel of phi. So for every element in the kernel, its inverse will also be in the kernel. Now finally, let's suppose that we have two different elements, k1 and k2, that are in the kernel of phi. What is phi of k1, k2? Well, we can split this up into phi of k1 times phi of k2. But we know both of these are in the kernel, which means this is the identity times the identity, which gives us the identity in h. So we see that for two elements in the kernel, phi of k1, k2 is also the identity, which means by definition, k1, k2 is in the kernel of phi. So we have three conditions here. The identity is in the kernel. For every element in the kernel, its inverse is also in the kernel. And the kernel is closed under multiplication. Those are the three conditions that we need for a subgroup, which means we can conclude that the kernel of a homomorphism is always a subgroup of the original group. We can actually go one step further than this because we can show that the kernel is a normal subgroup of G. To do that, let's suppose we have some elements in the group and some element in the kernel of phi. What we need to show is that G, K, G inverse, that conjugation, is still in the kernel. So what is phi of G, K, G inverse? Of course, we can use the homomorphism property. This becomes phi of G times phi of K times phi of g inverse. Now in this case, we know that phi of k is the identity because it's in the kernel. So this becomes the identity in h, and therefore we're just left with phi of g times phi of g inverse. But we know, again, because this is a homomorphism, we can combine this to get phi of g times g inverse. This is the identity in G, and therefore, phi of the identity gives us the identity in H.
So phi of g k g inverse is equal to the identity, which means by definition, g k g inverse is in the kernel of phi. And this is true for every element in the group and every k in the kernel, which means that the kernel is a normal subgroup of g. Now let's return to looking at the first isomorphism theorem. In that theorem, we start with a given homomorphism that goes from g to h. Our goal is to take this phi and construct some other map psi, which is an isomorphism. Now we know the difference between an isomorphism and a homomorphism is that an isomorphism needs to be bijective. In other words, injective and surjective. So let's see if we can take this homomorphism right here and turn it into something that is both injective and surjective. Let's start by looking at surjectivity. For psi to be surjective, we need to have that for every h in our codomain, it must be written as psi of g for some g in the domain. Let's consider the set of elements of the form phi of g such that g is in the group. We call this the image of the map phi. It's the set of all possible outputs in the codomain that we can get by starting in the domain and applying our function. We don't necessarily know whether the initial map phi is surjective, but there's actually a really easy way to make it surjective. We define a new map, I'll call this psi1, that goes from g, but instead of going to h, it goes to the image of phi. Now we're going to define this map to be exactly the same as the initial map phi. We're literally going to define that psi1 of g at every element is just equal to phi of g. But because we have a different codomain, we can now check whether this new function is surjective. For it to be surjective, that means that for every element in the codomain, we can write it as psi1 of g for some g in the domain. But remember that the codomain, by definition, is the image of phi, and that's the set of elements of the form phi of g. But we know phi of g is the same as psi1 of g, by the definition of psi1. And so what this means is that the codomain, this image of phi, is the set of elements that can be written as psi1 of g. So by definition, this map has to be surjective because we've defined the codomain to be the set of elements that we get starting from the domain and applying psi1. Now we need to make a new map psi, which is also injective so that we get a bijection. For that to be true, we need to have psi of a equals psi of b implies a equals b. To see how we can make a psi that satisfies that property, let's start by looking at the original homomorphism. Suppose that we have phi of x equals phi of y for some x and y in the group. The first thing that we're going to do is left multiply both sides by phi of y inverse. So we get phi of y inverse times phi of x equals phi of y inverse times phi of y. Now on the right side over here, we can combine this because we have a homomorphism. This becomes phi of y inverse y. This is just the identity in g, and we know the identity in g will get mapped to the identity in h. Now on the left side, we can combine these two because phi is a homomorphism. We get phi of y inverse x, and like we saw over here, that's going to be equal to the identity in h. In this, we can look at the definition of the kernel. Phi of this element is equal to e sub h, which means y inverse x has to be in the kernel of phi by definition. To make the notation a little shorter, I'm going to write k to mean the kernel of phi, and therefore we have y inverse x being an element of k. One of the consequences of that is that the coset y inverse x k is just equal to the original subgroup k. And if we multiply on the left by y on both sides here, we get that x k equals y k. Now the steps that we followed there were all biconditional. So what we get as a result is that phi of x is equal to phi of y, 
if and only if x and y are in the same coset of the kernel of phi. Now, what this means is that if the kernel of phi contains more than one element, if it contains more than just the identity element in G, then phi is not going to be injective because for two different elements of the kernel, phi of x is going to equal phi of y. In order to fix this, we need to change the domain of our map phi. And the way that we do that is by instead of looking at G, we're going to look at the quotient G mod the kernel of phi. So psi will go from g mod the kernel of phi to, like we saw up here, the image of phi so that it's surjective. And the map is going to be psi of g times k equals phi of g. Now the reason that this is useful is that when we look at a quotient group, every element in a coset of the subgroup is treated as the same element. We saw over here that when we have a problem with injectivity, when phi of x equals phi of y. That's only true when x and y are in the same coset. So if instead of considering individual elements, we consider those cosets to be the elements, then the only way we get two different outputs being the same is if the cosets are the same. And that means that the map with the cosets being the inputs is injective because having the same output must mean we start with the same coset. So this map is going to be injective, and we also see that because we're mapping to the image of phi, it's going to be surjective. And therefore, this map psi is bijective. Now all we need to do with this bijection is double check that it's still a homomorphism. To do that, let's take a look at what is psi of gk times hk. We know that the kernel is a normal subgroup, which means we can combine these to have psi of ghk. And then this is going to be, by the definition of our map here, phi of gh. On the other hand, if we look at psi of gk times psi of hk, that's going to be equal to this first thing becomes phi of g and the second part becomes phi of h. But we know phi is a homomorphism, which means phi of gh equals phi of g times phi of h. Therefore, psi of gk times hk equals psi of gk times psi of hk. This is the definition of a homomorphism. So we have that psi is bijective homomorphism, which means it is an isomorphism. And we conclude from that that these two groups must be isomorphic. The image of a homomorphism phi is isomorphic to g mod the kernel of phi. And that is the first isomorphism theorem. So if we're given a homomorphism, in order to turn it into an isomorphism, we need to solve the problems of injective and surjective. To solve surjectivity, all we need to do is set the codomain to be the image of the map. Then by definition, every element in the codomain can be written as phi of g for some element g, meaning it's surjective. To solve injectivity, we saw that if a homomorphism gives the same output for two different group elements, they need to be in the same coset. So if we change the inputs of the map to be instead of elements of the group, be cosets, then the only way that phi of g equals phi of h is if the input coset is the same, which means this map is injective. We can check that it's still homomorphism, and therefore we have that the image of phi, this codomain right here, is isomorphic to the quotient group, this set of cosets that we use as the input for the map psi. And that is the first isomorphism theorem.